Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's big video which features the contents of this relatively large and rather heavy box. So without further ado, let's perform the cesarean operation, get it open and see what our mission for today involves. Well, we have the box open and it looks like this is packed just about as well as an amp can be packed where it's surrounded by uh, styrofoam. Okay, so let's lift the panels out and see what uh, lurks beneath. It looks like our curiosity will have to persist for another minute or two because it has some sort of a cover. So let me lift the whole thing out. We'll remove the cover and take a look. And by Aunt Minnie's bra straps, uh, it's the darndest tweed tremolux I may have ever seen. Okay, I'm going to take the camera off the tripod so I can give you a close-up look at this thing, and you're not going to believe it. I was convinced this was a reissue of some sort, but it's not. Okay, we'll start here on the right side. You see there's a tiny little scuff there in the tweed. You can see the box joints coming through the tweed covering material. Look at the control panel. It looks like one of those new ones you might get like from Mojo Tone. Okay, spectacular. Gorgeous handle. Ah, obviously Keith Richards had something to do with this. Okay, um, oh, it's just, it's just incredible. Look, fender plate. And this one's actually straight. Okay, some of them are like a 20 degree angle. Flawless grill cloth. Wow. Let me turn this jewel around. We'll take a look at the rear and also of the amp. Well it just gets better. Look at this. Panels are perfect. Another look at the about the nicest tweed control panel I've ever laid eyes on. Gorgeous. Okay let's pull the upper rear cover get these out you know darn well they're going to be uh, tubes and other things that are packed up and we'll take a look at the uh, chassis look at the inside of that upper rear panel you tell this jewels played some ferocious licks in its life look at the output tube heat um, also the scratch and sniff asbestos sheet okay incredible before we look at the inside, I just wanted to focus on the outside here. This is one of the prettiest uh, tweed cabinets. Look at the finish on this. Those of you who are adding like tinted shellac and other things to your uh, recovered tweed cabinets, uh, this is the look that you want. Okay, it's really not orangish. It's just a beautiful sort of a very kind of a pale amber uh, yellow absolutely beautiful finish and in keeping with the way everything else was wrapped the a tube set here is you could drop this out of the plane okay over my house and after it bounced a few times the tubes would all still be usable I'm sure beautifully packed and also one other kind of a mystery pack here that we'll open in just a second now what we've all been waiting for a quick tour of the interior including a mint tube chart. Uh, look at the serial number 0060 and a 5E9 circuit in a Tremolux amplifier. Looks like whatever they originally printed for a rectifier tube they've changed it to a 5Y3. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that. Um, I wasn't aware they ever used anything else but we'll see. And one last observation before we move on from the tube chart, we see that it is rubber stamped EE, -E, which would be from the fifth month of 1955. So what that means is not only do we have a virtually flawless narrow panel tweed Vibrolux amp here, but since 1955 was the first year of issue for the Vibrolux, this must be the 60th Vibrolux amp ever built by Fender. Okay, I, I find that to be very impressive. 
this is truly a historic piece of musical equipment okay and uh, let's proceed then with the utmost of respect and care to try to make it sound just as good as it looks and now here for our speaker what appears to be a completely original P12Q Jensen Alnico speaker appears to be in beautiful shape Let's take a closer look at it uh, when I get a little better lighting. But now, here's the odd part. Let's look at the chassis. Okay, we see a what appears to be a replaced um, high wattage resistor. But you see anything missing? We've got our Astron uh, Type AM red paper wrapped capacitors like we're used to seeing. But I don't see any electrolytic caps. Okay, I think they've been removed and probably for a good reason. So uh, we'll have to investigate that. Also we see places here for our tubes. So let's take a look in this pack here and see if we can get any hints about why those electrolytics are missing. Okay, after unwrapping about two parsecs of green uh, bowl wrap I find inside 25, uh, 25 cap sleeves and electrolytic sleeves. Now here's the deal, also of course the 3 wire power cord to be installed. Uh, the owner wanted me to recap this with the new capacitors concealed within the old wrappers. Okay, so he's already gone through the trouble of extracting uh, the old uh, aluminum cased uh, capacitors from these sleeves and he also cut the little end discs and painted them black so he's done a good part of my work for me and I really appreciate it so that's what's going to happen then we're going to recap this much like we did that Princeton where when I get through recapping it hopefully uh, you will not be able to tell that it has been recapped okay it's going to appear that those old-fashioned cardboard wrapped caps are still in place so uh, I think it's time to get started and there you see within that heavily padded foam tube are the four cathode bypass caps um, just the housings ready to be stuffed with uh, new electrolytics I was in the process of removing the chassis from the cabinet and I came upon uh, one of those wonderful pieces of tape that we all look for in these um, tweed amps. It looks like Lily to me and there looks almost like there's part of a letter beyond the Y but L-I-L-Y, that's an unusual uh, way to spell it but I gotta admit it doesn't look like Loopy so apparently Loopy had a cohort um, with the soldering iron and um, she signed her name to this one okay so hats off to Lily we'll have to try to uh, see if we can't find more out about her here's a little hint when removing a fairly heavy chassis from a cabinet and especially when you absolutely don't want anything to happen to that chassis lay it down flat after you've loosened the nuts on both sides lay it down flat and then reach up inside and remove the nuts and, and lock washer and then the chassis will rest on the tabletop you can just lift the cabinet off of it there's no wrestling with heavy transformers and all while you're trying to unscrew both sides simultaneously okay so this just let gravity be your friend okay and try it this way now I've lifted the cabinet up off of the chassis and we get our first glimpse at the original transformers this is a Triad 8156 and the output transformer I don't really see markings on it which is fairly typical um, but I'm gonna bet you it's the right one okay there we go now um, I'm gonna set the cabinet in a safe place notice the offset of the speaker way over to the side to make room for the transformers Okay, let's set this to the side and uh, get started on our uh, chassis rewiring. A couple little notes before we get started. 
the original rectifier that was printed on the two charts of 5U4, and they backed off to a 5Y3. Okay, um, that's one observation. The second is, remember our serial number 0060? Well, it certainly agrees with the serial number stamped on the chassis. So this was probably the 60th one of these made. God knows how many they made all told, but uh, this was a very early one. Really low serial number. Very impressive. And, and still like almost like new condition. Just incredible. One more happy surprise is the number stamped on the perimeter of the 12-inch uh, Alnico speaker, 220, of course, is Jensen. And then we have a 5 and an 18. So this is from the 18th week of 1955, okay, which would be early in the model year and may be part of why the serial number is only a 0060. Okay, we're up here in the trusty uh, chassis stand, and uh, I'm looking at this a two-wire power cord, and the bulk of it and the way it's soldered, which is not really up to Lily's standards, I don't think, um, makes me think this might be a replacement cord. Just doesn't look right to me, so I'm going to unsolder it. Also, it's wired wrong, where uh, the hot wire is going to the fuse and the neutral wire is going to the switch. We don't do that anymore. So I'm just going to unsolder it and get it out of the way for now and then we'll install the uh, three-wire cord later. I went in the house and downloaded a schematic for the 5E9 Tremolux circuit and as you can see they show a 5Y3 rectifier. This was drawn uh, in the fourth month which is April of EE is 55. April of 55 according to the schematic that circuit used a 5Y3. Now, looking at the layout drawn at exactly the same time, April of 55, it shows a 5U4 rectifier. But then, as if to answer all our questions, we see this note. Model 5E9 used a 5Y3 GT rectifier instead of a 5U4. Okay, remember this is the 5E9A so the original first issue Vibraluxes used a 5Y3 instead of the 5U4 and that is exactly what uh, our amp is. It's an early issue so the 5Y3 rectifier is correct. Also we see a second note. Early models have the tremolo switch on the depth control instead of on the speed control. And when we look at the circuit in this Tremolux, we see this is the depth control, this is the speed control. You see the tremolo on-off switch right here is on the depth control as it should be with an early version of the circuit. Okay, so now we know uh, where the missing capacitors go. Uh, we'll have three uh, big electrolytics here. Uh, the circuit uh, calls for 16s which are kind of hard to get nowadays so I'm going to use uh, 22 microfarad at 500 volt F and T's. Okay now granted these are higher capacitance but if anything they should actually reduce the noise even better. Uh, the, by that I mean the 120 cycle hum and here we have our 25 at 50 volt uh, cathode bypass caps. So these are the ones that will be concealed within those uh, external cardboard wrappers from the uh, original uh, filter caps. While we're at it here looking at the schematic, let's review uh, and take a look at what type of circuit uh, the Tremolux used. We see a rather unusual first preamp tube uh, 12AY7, a dual triode uh, similar to a 12AX7 but with lower amplification factor. We have four inputs. Uh, they appear to be wired equivalently and uh, we see that the 12AY7 is not only cathode biased but cathode bypassed to maximize gain. Now we'll exit from the plates of the 12AY7 preamp tube and pass through 0.1 microfarad coupling caps 
to a tone control and a volume control. From them there is a single input to the 12 AX7 phase inverter top triode grid. Now this is a paraphase phase inverter. Now how does the paraphase inverter work? Well we see that since the grid was driven by our music signal and we have the output from the plate the plate signal is inverted when you drive the grid. So we have an inverted signal here through the 0.02 microfarad coupling cap to the grid of the upper 6V6. But some of that inverted plate signal is going to be fed down here to the grid of the lower triode. Okay, and the output from the plate of the lower triode will be double inverted. Okay, we have the inverted signal here. We invert it again, so now it's back in phase. So we have an out of phase signal to the upper 6V6, an in phase signal to the lower 6V6. We have our push pull relationship through the output transformer primary, which drives our 12 inch Alnico Jensen speaker. Now, since the Tremolux is essentially a deluxe circuit with tremolo added, let's take a look at the tremolo circuit in this amplifier. We see up here it involves both triodes of a 12 AX7 which is fairly standard okay as we'll see in Fender tremolos. You see the oscillation loop here is traditional 0 .01, 0 0.01, and 0 0.02. We can increase the value of either the 0.01's to slow it down. Okay we have our oscillation loop here and then uh, our speed control, which is in typical uh, configuration, will uh, alter the resistance to ground and change the speed of oscillation. We have the tremolo on-off switch here, which we know is piggybacked onto our depth control pot. And over here we have the depth adjustment, okay, and we see that the output from the oscillation loop is fed into this second triode of the 12AX7 and the cathode of that second triode interacts more or less depending on the setting of the depth control with the cathode of the phase inverter, the 12AX7. So what we have here is a cathode bias modulating tremolo. By altering the cathode bias of the 12AX7 phase inverter, we're going to increase or decrease the volume of the signal put out by the speaker. Okay, and remember that uh, tremolo is volume modulation, high volume, low, just like you've taken the volume control pot and turned it up and down. Okay, so that's how it's done in this particular circuit. All right, now it's time to stuff those old cardboard tubes that were removed from the original electrolytic capacitors. As you can see, uh, the uh, F&Ts are a little smaller in diameter, so uh, the owner of the amp provided uh, some foam to take up the slack. And in this case, as you can see, I've used the black painted dowel uh, discs to fill each end. There's no rattle because of the foam and um, this then I think would pass muster as being an original uh, Astron Mini Mite even though it's really a brand new F&T 22 microfarad electrolytic cap. Now it's time to do the other two. Uh, one little tip if you're trying this at home is to bevel the inner corner of the black disc to help you get it past the kind of a ragged uh, outer rim here of the cardboard uh, tube so that you can fit this in and then curve the cardboard back over it. The beveling really is essential. And now the three uh, Astron Mini Mites have been uh, restuffed with a brand new 22 microfarad F&T caps 
and they're ready to install. Also, um, something I did in the Princeton video was to mark the positive lead on each of the F and T caps just so that after I got them all together I wouldn't start having doubts about whether I might have transposed one inside the uh, tube. This way I can look and see, yes, their polarity is correct. Now the four smaller cathode bypass caps uh, will be stuffed with the 25 microfarad at 50 volt of brand new electrolytics using the same technique with the cardboard uh, tube, a little bit of foam to take up the slack, and the beveled edge disc pushed in after the cap has been installed. Okay, here are the 25 microfarad at 50 volt caps restuffed. Uh, as you can see, they actually look pretty convincing. I did mark the positive end on all of them with some black ink so that I could double check when I got through and not be nervous. There's a good example. That one was reversed. Let's see. So, they uh, are all finished and now it's time to install. I have reinstalled all seven of those Astron Mini Mite electrolytic caps that were restuffed with modern uh, brand new electrolytics and as you can see um, the circuit looks like it's untouched back from 1955 which was the original goal okay it's a lot more work but I really think it's worth it and just classic beautiful vintage amps like this next step uh, will be to plug in the tubes and test the four uh, coupling caps they are 2.1s and 2.02s and uh, I'll show you how that's done. As you see here from the 12AY7 because it has two triodes there are two coupling caps between each triode and the following 12AX7 grid. Okay so we come from the plate of the 12AY7 through the point one at 400 to the grid so I'll have to check these two coupling caps and then from the plates of the 12AX7 we have 0.02 microfarad coupling caps to the grids of the 6V6s. So four coupling caps and all four will have to be checked. Let's take a few moments away from our project to open a nice Christmas present here from a Mr. Shea in Massachusetts. Wow, check this out. An acrylic guitar stand and a birch plywood guitar stand. Stainless steel hinges and some toys that the kitties I know are going to enjoy. Uh, it was accompanied by a letter. Let's take a look. Let's see. In close, please find some treats for the cats along with a couple of guitar stands for you. Clear stand is acrylic. Uh, the wood is seven ply Baltic birch finished with Danish oil and furniture paste wax. Stainless steel hinges. His wife helps him. The stands are available uh, for sale on both Reverb and on eBay. And it appears that uh, his business name is Centerfold Stands. So if any of you like the looks of this, and who wouldn't, uh, especially for some of those early plexiglass body guitars, uh, both in acrylic and in the birch plywood. I suggest then that you check out Centerfold Stands on uh, both Reverb and eBay. So thanks so much, Mark, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. Next on the Holiday Hit Parade are all the fantastic gifts that the kiddies received from uh, generous fans and viewers. Look at all those treats, these toys, little vial of catnip that you put inside some of the toys, big box of greenies, and a, a hand-painted in oils painting of Ollie celebrating her uh, move into the house by my good friend Jay in California. He sure captured the eye color. Man, that's perfect. I think it's a great impressionistic painting and all sorts of fantastic treats and toys for my favorite girls and boys. 
And then a gift for yours truly uh, from Craig Hollibaugh. It's a, a kind of a key caddy for all the hot rod keys. You connect the key to a quarter inch uh, jack and then you get like a mini fender guitar head that you plug them into and this uh, goes up on the wall. Really snazzy Craig and very useful. Thank you. I also got a CD from a group called Bandit. They play kind of good old-fashioned rock music and this is their uh, album CD uh, Retro Nova. And last and certainly not least is this incredible metal sculpture here from my friend and amp repair customer Greg Baker. You can see it's an institutional uh, light bulb um, housing here with fittings screwed in, right angle fittings, and uh, bulbs to simulate the rocket engines firing it's at a, a sporty angle here with a just beautiful uh, hardwood base. Okay, sort of a mosaic pattern. All very industrial, very steampunkish. And inside the rocket is this, what I believe is an LED light bulb. Okay, in that uh, classic old Mazda shape. Let's uh, turn down the lights and turn this beast on and you'll see it in action. Okay, are you ready? Kind of get glared out there by the rocket, but look at those engines. Pretty snazzy, eh? I'm thinking about putting in a kind of a tubular piece of sheet metal inside with portholes cut that will kind of suppress the brightness of that LED bulb and um, still make it look even more like a rocket ship. I hope uh, Greg would approve. But anyway, thanks so much uh, to Greg and to everyone else who was so thoughtful at Christmas uh, to remember me and the kitties. And uh, let's hope you keep enjoying our videos and stay tuned. Okay, we're going to see you all here in the near future. Thanks again. Unfortunately, the three-wire power cord sent with the amp for me to install is the European color coding, which really isn't appropriate for a 1955 Vibrolux. So I went to my cord stash and found one that has the more customary black, white, and green uh, colors. And I'm going to cover the green with shrink wrap because, uh, you know, there, no green ground wire was ever seen in a tweed amp. So uh, this has to be uh, neutralized so that it won't stand out. The new three wire power cord has been installed. The black wire up here to one side of the uh, on off toggle. Then a piece of vintage cloth covered wire coming from the other side of the toggle to the tip of the fuse. And then from the panel uh, end of the fuse, we're going into the primary of the power transformer. The other side uh, of the uh, power transformer primary is con uh, connected directly to the white return wire. The green or ground wire is covered with a shrink wrap and soldered to the chassis. Also it should be noted that the so-called death cap has been detached from the primary AC circuit and I just left laying here at the bottom of the chassis uh, not really connected to anything but ground. I also use the original strain relief uh, piece here so uh, everything external looks like it should. I'm installing the tube set that came with the amp and uh, it's every bit as wonderful as the amp itself. Uh, they're all vintage tubes, RCA 6V6s, uh, 12AX7s. Uh, they look to be in some cases NOS totally impressive but instead of a 12AY7 in our first preamp position I was sent a 12AX7. Now there's a big difference. The 12AX7 has an amplification factor of 100 uh, so I went and dug into my tube stash and found a genuine uh, vintage 12AY7 and it has an amplification factor of only 40 Okay, so it's 40% the output of the 12AX7 and it's a big part of the character of the sound from one of these tweed uh, Vibroluxes. So I'm going to plug my tube in and we're going to use it for our testing purposes and for our audio evaluation. 
now with the proper 12 AY7 preamp tube installed the Euro tubes bias probes in series with the 6V6 output tubes to give us a reading of the plate current and plate voltage to be sure that uh, it's not way too high and we don't damage the tubes while we're testing the amp. Okay, we'll do a preliminary check. Uh, we've plugged in the amp with the newly installed 3 wire power cord and it's time to switch it on and see what happens. Alright, the tubes have stabilized. We see that the plate current is too high in the right hand 6V6. Uh, this is about right. Remember these uh, tubes are cathode biased so they can go up to around 11 or 12 watts maximum. This is way over so this plate current will have to be brought down. These tubes do not do not match real well. We'll have to check into that too. I switch the tubes in the sockets just to make sure that we don't have something wrong with one of the sockets. Remember the left one was 36, the right one was 43 and now they've completely changed position just like the tubes so it is the tubes it isn't the socket uh, next we're going to have to alter the bias resistor to bring this down to a tolerable level that tube mismatch was a little too wide for my liking it was a little over seven milliamps uh, which can cause a little hum if you're not careful so I went to the tube stash and found a similar vintage 6v6 and uh, I put it in and you see we're within what about three milliamps so I'm going to use my tube with one of the uh, original tubes and we're going to use this uh, for our uh, continued testing um, our bias adjustment and for our audio demo now I'm going to double check the bias with the replacement tube remember there's one tube that came with the amp and one from my stash and we're getting pretty good agreement here let's write down these values and calculate our plate dissipation for our 6v6's alright I come up with 13.5 watts on the left 6v6 13.1 watts on the right uh, now this is above the maximum plate dissipation for vintage 6v6's uh, it's, it probably should be closer to around say 11 watts 10 to 11 watts so uh, we're going to have to cool these tubes down a little bit by increasing the value of the bias resistor after experimentation with several different bias resistor values I found that uh, 500 ohms worked quite well uh, you see here we got 28.5 milliamps at 377 plate volts which gives us around 10.86 watts of plate dissipation which I think is ideal the tube should last and the tone should be great so uh, I'm gonna hardwire in this uh, larger bias resistor and then we'll recheck and make sure that everything's still okay now that the output tubes are properly biased, it's time to focus on the final components that we will need to uh, evaluate, and that is the coupling caps. Okay, they are essential to the proper operation of the amplifier, and they are subjected generally to some fairly high voltage. Now, there are several ways to do this that require special equipment in which the cap is removed from the circuit, charged up to full operating um, voltage, and then leakage is measured. I have a more dynamic way that you can uh, perform your uh, check with the capacitor in circuit and under normal operating conditions. And that is, I simply plug in the amp, turn it on, and then measure the plate current in the tube on the far side of the coupling caps. Here's two point ones uh, at 400 volts and both of them are going to affect the plate current in the phase inverter 12AX7. Um, now how am I going to do that? Well I'm going to measure the voltage drop across the bias resistor which is our normal way of measuring the uh, plate current in a tube that is cathode biased so we're going to hook up the amp get it running put our clips on either side of the 1500 ohm bias resistor and see 
if the voltage drop across it remains constant. If it does, it means that these capacitors are functioning properly. If it starts to drift upward, it means that the positive DC from the plate is coming through, leaking through, getting to the uh, grid of the tube and causing a greatly enhanced plate current through the grid. Okay, so uh, let's hook up our leads, turn on the amp and monitor the stability of the plate current within the phase inverter 12AX7. Now the digital multimeter probes are connected to either side of the uh, bias resistor which is underneath the bypass cap. Okay, and we see it shows on the schematic as being um, 1500 ohms and it is right on the money about 14 151 ohms. Now I'm going to change from resistance over here to DC voltage. We'll turn on the app and we'll monitor the voltage drop across that resistor over a period of like four or five minutes. All right, the app has been on now for oh, two or three minutes. It's stabilized and we see that the voltage drop across the 1500 ohm uh, cathode bias resistor which tells us the stability of the plate current within the tube is right at 2.5 volts. Now I'm going to turn off the camera, wait about two or three more minutes and let's see if it stays at this value or if it goes up. We know that if the uh, coupling caps leak this will steadily increase. If it stays constant these coupling caps are fully functional. Okay, two more minutes have passed, and as you see, it's absolutely stable. Okay, I think we can trust the 0.1s. Now let's move on to the 0.02 microfarad coupling caps for our output tubes. And we can use our uh, Eurotubes bias probes for this purpose uh, because they give us a reliable measurement of plate current within the tube. Okay, this uh, has been on now for three or four minutes and it looks very stable to me, 30.3, 25.2. I see no upward trend in plate current and I haven't seen any over the past few minutes. So I'm going to say that the 0.02 microfarad at 400 volt coupling caps for the output tubes are functioning properly. Now if you don't have Eurotube bias probes, uh, you can revert back to the uh, manual method that I just demonstrated for the 12AX7 and measure the stability of the voltage drop across the cathode bias resistor for the two output tubes. And as an added bonus, we can look back here at the voltage drop on our 12AX7. This is four or five minutes later and it's still right at 2.5. Okay, so our coupling caps pass muster and I think it's time now for our audio demonstration. One added benefit of this method is that once you know the voltage drop across the cathode bias resistor and you know its resistance, you can divide and determine the a plate current within the 12AX7. Now bear in mind this is for both triodes because they both share a common cathode bias resistor. So uh, you see that between the two the total is uh, 1.7 milliamps. Uh, now that's well within the acceptable parameters for 12AX7s. That would be about 0.85 uh, milliamps per uh, triode. Well, the chassis has been reinstalled in the cabinet. The speaker's plugged in. I'm going to uh, install the rear door just because it might have some effect on the tone of the amp. Then I'll turn it around and we can begin our audio demonstration. Well, it looks like we're all set up and ready for the audio demonstration of our 1955 Fender Tremolux amp. Uh, we have the traditional Shure M57 aimed just off center of the Alnico speaker cone. And we're going to play uh, four tunes through the instrument input, four tunes through the microphone input, and a couple tunes with the tremolo at different speeds and depths. Okay, so here we go. Thank you. 
Well, I guess that's about it for this video featuring the 1955 Model 5E9 Fender Tremolux amp. I want to take a few moments to express my traditional appreciation uh, to all my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors who have kept us on the air and so far advertising free for another month. Should you choose uh, to join them in support of our channel, uh, I will put links in the video description which will enable you to do so. I also wanted to thank all the very generous viewers who sent uh, such wonderful uh, Christmas gifts to both me and my furry little elves. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, you all are the greatest. And now for a part two video. Uh, this will be a little change of pace, but it's in response to a bunch of requests I got to discuss how to build a chassis stand for amplifier repair. And what I'm going to do is I will go through how the stand that I have, the homemade stand, was made and also how a, a commercial stand looks and works. Okay, so if that sounds interesting, please stay tuned. Well, greetings and welcome to our part two video in which we will discuss how to construct our own uh, amplifier chassis stand as you have seen in several of my videos. Uh, once this stand showed up and it was given to me by a very generous viewer, uh, a whole bunch of other viewers started asking how can they make their own version of this. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, how it was constructed and I'm also going to uh, show a pattern here that shows each of the pieces of wood with all of the dimensions. Now I'm going to draw this up a little bit neater and I will post it uh, with a link in the video description. So for those who have a table saw and rather rudimentary woodworking skills, uh, all you have to do is cut out the pieces that I show in my diagram and uh, we'll discuss right now very quickly how to assemble them into your fi uh, finished stand. First off, this floor here is 28 by 8 inches wide and it is the full length and width of the unit. Okay, then there are two rails, one on either side, which are one and a half inches by 27 and a quarter. The reason they're not 28 is we're going to have this vertical piece here that's three quarters of an inch thick so that your rails will come flush at this end and flush here with the tail piece on the um, base unit here. I guess we could call this the cradle. Okay, so we have the floor piece, the 28 by 8 inch floor, and we got the two side rails uh, glued in place, and then we glue the vertical wall. You notice that it doesn't come all the way to the bottom, but it butts right up against the edge of the floor. Also, while I have it in this position, we have our four screwed on rubber feet, and we also have a uh, one of those tack-in type of a nuts, a T-nut, here in the floor, and I'll give you the dimensions of where it's located. Uh, I modified this stand a bit by adding a second one right here. We'll talk about that in a few minutes also. If you notice, uh, the joints are both glued and screwed. It's quite poetic. And um, you want it to be good and solid. Okay, so that's how the cradle is assembled. And then, just for a nice touch, there is a, a one and a half by eight inch piece, an extension that comes off of this vertical piece. You could probably live without it, but uh, it gives you a nice, a wider surface for your chassis to lay against. And I put uh, some uh, kind of corrugated rubber material I bought at Lowe's, put it on here so that it's it won't abrade the uh, chassis and it has more friction, kind of hold it in place. Okay, so that's how the cradle is made. We'll talk about these holes in just a few minutes. Next we have the sliding piece here and it's a little more um, complex. Uh, it's six and a half inches wide 
and 15 inches long and if as you see it goes the full length of the sliding unit all of the uh, wood here is three-quarter inch birch plywood okay I really recommend that you use something like that so you have a nice smooth surface and it looks decent and it has strength and it's not going to warp this was just cut out of plywood however I notice okay so uh, now we have the floor of the sliding unit and then then we have the end piece of the slider unit which you see perches right atop the floor and um, it is eight inches wide just like this end but because it's perched up on three quarters uh, of an inch of plywood it's only seven and a quarter inches tall from here to here okay so uh, that means that from the floor right here all the way up to the top it's exactly eight inches tall just like the other side otherwise you're going to have your chassis at an angle these two surfaces here have to be at exactly the same height once again another little perch was added on here to give a little bit wider uh, area for the amp chassis to lay upon we should also notice the three and a half by one and a half inch braces that reinforce and strengthen that vertical wall on the slider unit so that it can't come loose and uh, move uh, outward and allow the chassis to fall crushing your precious Ampere X 12 AX 7s. One last bit of detail is the three quarter by three quarter cutout here at the bottom of that back wall to allow clearance of the side rails. The side rails then will fit right in here. And then as you see the slider fits in between the side rails and can move left and right. And the final consideration here is this slot that has been milled, although you can use a saw blade, a saber saw, uh, anything of that sort to make a slot a little bit wider than 5 16 with one inch uh, inlet here okay from the end and one and three quarters inch from this end remember that the piece goes all the way to the end this is hiding three quarters of an inch of your floor so you want one and three quarters of an inch to the end for the uh, where your slot terminates okay now if you look down through there you can see the hole that's been drilled in the floor and that hole is located in the exact center of the floor piece since the floor piece is 28 inches long it's 14 inches from the left 14 from the right 4 inches in and 4 inches up okay dead center okay and it is located directly under the slot now what we will then use is a 5 16 inch threaded uh, either piece of threaded stock or a bolt or something like that with a, a wing nut on the on the end or a knob like this this looks like a, an adjuster you could probably buy at Home Depot you place it right through your floor and then you're going to screw this down and when you set your supports to exactly the right width for your chassis you'll just tighten this down and lock them in place so that they can't move and your chassis can lay atop this quite easily now the uh, bolt that you need is going to be as I said 5 16 and about one and a half inches long because you're going to be going through three quarters of an inch of plywood and three quarters of an inch of plywood and you'll need a little leeway for a washer and then because we're up on rubber feet it can protrude a little bit through the t-nut so I'm thinking around one and a half inches maybe one and a quarter inches for the length of the threaded stock that you use to lock this down now why did I drill this extra hole well when you close this to its smallest width there's still 14 and a half inches here between the supports and several of the chassis that I've worked on were less than that 
in width so the chassis stand wouldn't work. They would just fall through. So let me show you what I came up with to solve that problem. Well a solution came to mind uh, and that is you remove the locking bolt, take the slider out and reverse it and then put the locking bolt in to the hole that I drilled second. Now the hole that I drilled to allow the slider to be reversed so that you can uh, use this unit to support smaller chassis is located midway between the left edge of the cradle and the center. So that's going to be 7 inches from the left, 7 inches from the center hole. Now your cradle is adjustable from very, very narrow to a reasonable width but you can accommodate 12, 13, 14 inch chassis this way. The only change necessary was to drill a second hole and put in a T-nut. Everything else is the same, even the locking device. Okay, so that's how this is built. And like I said, I'm going to draw up a, a simple diagram of the pieces of wood that you need to cut. And then if you uh, watch the video that uh, I've just made, you'll see how those pieces go together, all the details of how they uh, are assembled, and I think you can build your own. Now, what about those of you who do not have table saws, drills, uh, routers, or uh, whatever it takes to build this, uh, and you still want to have a chassis stand? Well, if you're willing to spend some money, let me show you a second. By coincidence, I was contacted by the people at Mojo Tone and asked if I would do a demonstration uh, or an evaluation of their chassis stand. And I thought, wow, what a coincidence, okay? I had uh, been intending to cover the homemade one. So let's see what your alternative is. If you don't want to spend the time and effort and don't have the tools to build that, let's see what's available to you and uh, if it's really worth maybe a little greater expenditure. Now just for the record, uh, this is what it's called and what its part number is, so if you decide you want to contact Mojo Tone and get one of these jewels, uh, this is what you'll be ordering. Well, if, let's say this, it's beautifully packed. Okay, so let's uh, get it out of the box and on the workshop table so we can see what we got. All right, I'm impressed. Take a look at what we got here. Really nice baseboard with uh, little pockets here for uh, components, nuts and bolts and things like that. They're inlet into the baseboard and lined with uh, black felt. Got the Mojo Tone label up here. Really snazzy. Uh, kind of a enameled chrome metal. And uh, you see the sliding pieces both are able to slide left and right unlike uh, the one I have in which only one of the uh, sides will slide. Also uh, we have our uh, locking bolts here, our T-nuts and our washers. They sent a little sticker and some guitar picks as well which is always welcome. So now I'm going to finish the assembly by installing the lock nuts on either side of the sliders with the T-nuts underneath. Okay, and I'll be right back once I've done that and we'll see how, how smoothly it moves. And also I see two features about this that I like better than my homemade one. While I was assembling the unit, I found a nice touch that those sliding lock uh, bolts or actually Allen head uh, bolts and so I guess if you tighten it too much where you can't loosen it with your fingers or you want it really tight you could use an Allen wrench okay in that socket in the head of the uh, knob all right I completed the assembly it took all of about 30 seconds okay you see that the uh, locking uh, bolts uh, now are connected to the T-nuts and I, there is a problem, I think, and here's something I think you could do if you get one of these to make it a lot better. And that is when it's sitting on the table now, it's sitting on the T-nuts. And that makes it really hard for you to slide 
the sliding pieces, even though they're loose, okay, your the weight of the unit is pushing the T-nut into the wood at the bottom. So I'm going to install some rubber feet on this right now and see if it doesn't make things work a little better. All right, I've installed my world famous uh, Home Depot rubber feet on all four corners and now the unit sits up off the countertop. It won't slide around but the left and right sliders will move easily. And a final touch that I think is a real good one for nicely made wood objects like this is to coat the surface and seal it with Johnson's paste wax. I'm going to do that and I'll be right back. Alright, the unit is assembled and you notice we have like a little L here at the bottom of the uh, piece that's going to hold the chassis have a matching one on the other side and the beauty of this is that you with this unit can tilt the chassis toward you so that you're working not up here on top trying to work down on it and you know how tiresome that gets for your neck and your back you can actually sit down and with the chassis tilted toward you work straight ahead okay so your neck is not uh, cramp for hours on end. Thought that was very clever. Also, another benefit that this has is that this piece restricts the travel of the chassis that way. This piece restricts it that way. So when you kind of wedge it in between these two uprights, it cannot possibly move left or right and fall off of one of the uh, uprights, which it really can do with the homemade stand. So, uh, you can operate it with the pivots at a low position like this, uh, which would be best for me. I have a fairly high workbench, so I don't really want this thing way up in my face. Or, if I had a shorter workbench, I'd move the pivot up to here and move the locker into that um, routered arc, and it would be up here moving back and forth. So you've got height adjustment, tilt, and sure locking in of your chassis so it doesn't fall off one end and crush your uh, Amperex uh, 12 AX7s. So I guess that's about it. I see some definite benefits to this and it is beautifully made. So this is your second option. Okay, uh, I'm going to use this one uh, for the next few videos just to kind of get a hang of it. Uh, and um, I really appreciate the fine people at Mojo Tone for sending this to me. And uh, I'm only too glad to evaluate uh, good quality merchandise like this. And I think I'm doing you viewers a service because I'm uh, making you aware of the availability of something that you might not have known about. Okay, so. Uh, that's it for our discussion on two different types of chassis stands. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you uh, in the near future in our next video.